Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last session of today's program regarding accountability and disciplinary matters. Uh, let me just start off by saying it's been a terrific day for me to witness everything that's happened. I want to thank in particular the small group that I've been working with for several months, Kathleen Fisk, Joe Groden, Felton Henderson, Ron Yank, John True, who's been a major contributor to our group, was not a participant today, but we could not have done anything we've done uh, without uh, John's involvement. And you can see the particular proposals that people have referenced from time to time uh, on the sort of the bibliographic link that's posted uh, with the program. Uh, the panelists today, uh, it's a great group of people. I'll introduce them briefly. Their full biographies are in the materials. Uh, together, they have over a century of public of experience in public sector and public safety, in particular, law enforcement work. Um, uh, Paul Henderson. Uh, Paul, want to wave your hand so everybody sees where you are? There you are. Paul is a former prosecutor in San Francisco. He served at the time when Vice President, now Vice President uh, Harris, was then the district attorney. He is now and has been for some period the executive director of San Francisco's Department of Police Accountability, which operates under the aegis of the Civil Service Commission and provides investigation and advocacy work in cases of officer misconduct in relation to matters coming before the commission. Uh, it's a pretty unique agency uh, nationally. Uh, Harry Stern, Harry, show us your hand. There he is. Harry is the managing principal of Reigns, Lucia, Stern, St. Paul, and Silver which is, uh, if not the most important uh, law enforcement uh, union law firm in the state of California, certainly one of them. Uh, in addition, uh, Harry is a former police officer himself, and for a period of time, he worked as an appellate counsel in the state attorney's office in Illinois, uh, and also he's been a member of the uh, University of California Police Review Board. Uh, Jeannie Charles, Jeannie, you there? Jeannie's uh, waving to us from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. She is a nationally prominent arbitrator based in Fort Lauderdale, but also with extensive uh, base of uh, activity in Chicago. She works in both the public and private sectors, extensive experience in uh, law enforcement. Uh, and I'll mention she's gonna be very busy over the next few weeks because she also does baseball salary arbitrations. Uh, but that's not our subject today, right, Jeannie? Um, uh, Jeannie is a member of the Board of Governors of the National Academy of Arbitrators and uh, also is the chair of the Academy's uh, video conference task force. And I will say a special thanks any Academy members who are watching and arbitrators and, whoops, ar arbitrators and advocates who are watching also know that uh, uh, the Academy's work in the video conference area under uh, Jeannie's leadership has been spectacular and has really helped maintain the ability of people to arbitrate and resolve disputes since this uh, pandemic uh, struck our land. Uh, there are a few basic points I would like to mention uh, before we get started with questions. First, we are going to be dealing with disputes that typically arise in arbitration proceedings under collective bargaining agreements or in hearing officer proceedings, uh, often uh, under the uh, Civil Service Commission in some municipalities. Uh, of course, this, this area of arbitration or dispute resolution has been under great scrutiny for several years, uh, going back to the Ferguson uh, matters and other matters, uh, and up to and through and since the George Floyd situation. Uh, if you're interested in looking at some of the uh, detailed analyses and studies of arbitration outcomes, some of which Will Aitchison just referred to in the previous session, they are listed in the comprehensive bibliography. Uh, that's uh, part of the program. Uh, our study group that I described earlier, we operated on, on the following premise, or several premises, but for present purposes, this is the one that is most important. We, unif I guess, generally believed, or you know, unanimously believed that law enforcement officers generally have more protection, both statutory and by virtue of contract, but particularly statutory, than regular other public employees. And we tried to walk a very fine line because we did not want to advance proposals, particularly for legislative consideration, that could, as uh, Senator Skinner was describing earlier, 
could then become uh, fodder for regular public employee unions, I say regular, non-law enforcement, uh, to then uh, join in. We wanted to level the playing field a little bit more, so to speak. Uh, another point. Uh, we realize that any reforms uh, such as the ones we are discussing need to be implemented through statutes and negotiated agreements. We are not talking about things that are part of a unilateral fiat of management. Last, uh, we are not in our discussion today focusing on what management can do independently to improve its own procedures regarding investigation, charging, and advocacy. Uh, that's an area that Paul Henderson is quite expert in, and unfortunately, we're not going to be able to draw on his full expertise today on that. But that's certainly something that DPA in San Francisco uh, has pioneered uh, uh, in its area of work. I think that's a fair, fair assessment uh, of that, uh, because in many ways it operates independently of the department itself. Uh, but it's nevertheless still part of the management of the city. It's an independent agency. We have five topics we are going to focus on today. These are not all of our proposals, uh, but they are several, uh, several from our package. Uh, one is time limits on the use of past disciplinary records. Second, restricting evidence of disparate treatment in discipline cases. Third, applying a, har a harmless error standard for investigations and interrogations. Fourth, uh, issues regarding just cause, the public interest, and reinstatement. And fifth, the impact of back pay determinations on related cases. Uh, each of our panelists has offered to take the laboring uh, initial or on one topic or another, and I will call on them. I'll ask them a question, and I'll let them go. And uh, uh, we're hoping that no more than 10 minutes will be spent on each of these topics, maybe some less, some more. Uh, and I will try and pull the plug or move it along and interject with other questions. We've had a couple of pre-webinar uh, pre, uh, uh, conversations, and uh, I think we all enjoyed them in a sense, uh, in terms of finding them rewarding uh, with the cross-fertilization of views. So with that said, uh, let me turn to Paul on sure. the subject of time limits on the use of past disciplinary records, a subject that has been somewhat touched upon already. Uh, to the extent that there are time limits on the use of past disciplinary records, are these an obstacle for discipline uh, for recent misconduct? And if so, how can such limits be modified by statute, contract, or otherwise without opening the door to the use of unfounded, stale accusations and hearsay, or even, as Will Aitchison said a moment ago, uh, excessive uh, exposure of intimate details. Tell us right. how we should handle this problem. Okay, so uh, <laughs> let, let me frame it a little bit further because just to give it context for folks that may not know uh, much about the area because time limits specifically uh, is a contractual issue, right? So that means that it falls into the administrative realm, which is why we're having the, con the conversation as it relates to labor in the first place. So typically these are rules around use of information with time limits that goes into memorandums of understandings or what's contracted in the individual counties. And like so, a one year or a two year roll off. It, right. Or whatever the rule is, but that's where it comes from. And that's why we're having the conversation because it's not something, there are rules about uh, discipline records and time limits as they relate to civil proceedings and as it relates to criminal proceedings as well, but that's a different category because how it applies in the administrative approach is defined by those individual contexts. That's how we get into the labor negotiation pool to have this conversation anyway. I'm just framing it to give okay. context to what we're talking about. Well, how does it tie your hands? Well, here, here's how it works. And I think it's really important when you start talking about, uh, and these are the three areas that I think it relates to when you talk about the time limits, discipline, uh, promotions and in notification. And the notification has two prongs because I would say that the notification speaks to both informing the officer and informing the public. That's particularly relevant in a time post 1421, the state bill that turns over discipline records because people need to know what can be turned over, when it can be turned over. And so that's why it's, it's relevant to that. So I think it's really interesting when we look at this issue 
just looking, if you take a step back, as to how different counties are regulating or not regulating the area. And the, the fact that there are counties that don't regulate it, figuring out whether or not that, that was done with the level of intentionality or not. And specifically, I'm talking about uh, counties like Oakland and in San Diego that have no limitations for time limits. Oakland, as we know, has a, is under a consent decree. And so whether or not that was intentional or not, maybe answer some of the questions about looking at how we view the other counties that have really strict rules about the timeline for time limits. All right, well, let's say there's no time limit in yeah. Alameda County, Oakland, or San Diego. Let's say there's no time. Should there be some, should an arbitrator apply some rule of evidence, you know, like, well, this is hearsay. You know, maybe it was a found, a, a charge that was sustained and it's a sustained charge and it's a settled record, so to speak. You know, we already have it, it was disciplined, but you want to get into the underlying stuff because maybe there's an echo in a more recent charge. Have you had that problem come up? I think the answer on a case by case basis and a situation like that is by a determination. I hate to, to adopt this legal standard, but the legal standard is by what's reasonable. And here's why that matters. Many of the rules from various counties have limited it by subject matter, but that subject matter is limited. And I'll give you an example. So you know what we're talking about uh, for like for aggregate offenses, right? So you can't count an aggregate offense unless it's of the same nature, the same type of mm -hmm. offense. And then it's balanced against typically what we're talking about in the first place is a time limit or a frame of reference. So counties can do anywhere from, like I said, we talked about the counties that don't have limits, but counties like uh, Sacramento, uh, which has a limit of 18 months, before letters are removed from records. Places and counties like Riverside has a five year limitation before records are purged. And LA County have limitations so that uh, allegations have to be sustained before they can go into a file. And right, so there's, it, you, you know, it, it's different from county to county. So in looking at the issue, you really have to look at the contractual guideline in that county to determine what the time limitations are. I think, and you haven't asked this question yet, but I Go think- ahead, this, answer it then. Okay, <laughs> this, this, is, this is one of the areas that is right for state legislation to evaluate or look at, should there be a standard? And if so, what that standard should be? Because it- So that'd be uniform, there'd be uniform around. It could be uniform. Generally, you go county to county to make a determination as to yeah. what records are even relevant for that force that you're evaluating and which conduct may be allowable. And then you still have to do a secondary analysis of what the limitations are in terms of have these allegations been sustained? Are they mere allegations? And I think that speaks to what you raised earlier about when the hearing, the topic yeah. Yeah. was about the hearsay. What are the standards that we're using one to define the appropriate subject matter and once the appropriate subject matter has been defined if it's still relevant and timely to be used in whatever the context from the initial three factors and categories that i gave you in the beginning and that was both for discipline for promotional purposes and then for notification purposes all right let's hear from, i want to hear from harry how are you there i am you're still here harry you're a union lawyer okay so and I know from our previous conversations, you like arbitration. You think arbitration is a good system. So should all of this just be left up to the arbitrator or should there be time limits? Well, uh, here in California, and the limit that is generally applied in the absence of some other specific rule under a contract or local rules is five years. And that's found in the statutory scheme Mm -hmm. uh, having to do with personnel records uh, on the 832, the peace officer uh, schedule. And I think, you know, standardization is always good. Five years seems to me to strike the balance of um, hitting that sweet spot of a point that's not too far and not too near. So, you know, for me, uh, of course, as an advocate, what I'm interested in is rehabilitation, uh, the idea and the principle that I firmly believe that everybody, even cops, are uh, when they make mistakes are capable of being resurrected. 
So you yes. believe in the principle of, but there's problems with the repeat offenders too, right? Of course, there are problems with the repeat offenders. And uh, usually what I find is that uh, this comes down to, you know, an issue of the original type of discipline. So something so egregious, uh, it usually gets handled in the first immediate instance rather than uh, something that needs to be assessed under a progressive discipline. But let me ask you this. Uh, the last panel was focusing in particular on sustained versus not sustained. Mm -hmm. uh, would it be fair to assume that you believe that only sustained disciplinary determinations should come forward later on? Sure. And, you know, this, I guess this is going to be uh, an ongoing theme throughout our time here together. And my pitch is always for due process. So, you know, if something didn't even arise to the level of being sustained under preponderance of evidence, what good is it for? Um, well, you know, I just raise the issue and, and jump sure. in because I you just raised a really super interesting point that that speaks to one of the issues that takes place is after all of the records have been collected, the issue of the hearings being stopped and or the presentation being stopped when a member leaves or resigns from right. a county, right? And so you never get to the sustained fulfillment for whatever reason. That's an, it, it opens the door. Right, into a whole right. that's problem. another issue. And that's why in civil, in, 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 in civil litigation, right. uh, take sexual harassment litigation, there's a whole doctrine of what's called Me Too evidence, right? Where, right. where evidence could come in even if it hasn't been sustained. It's just a charge because it goes to the question, sort of modus operandi intent questions. But let yes. me ask Jeannie. Jeannie, um, yes. let, me, let me ask you to take the final shot on this one. Um, uh, do you feel comfortable uh, if you have a case where there's a three or four or five year time limit and yet you know from somebody's offer of proof that there is been something very similar that this officer did, you know, eight years ago, I mean, and they want to get it in. Are you stuck? I think I am because I'm, I am hired to be the contract interpreter. If they have agreed that um, I can't consider that information, then I'm, I can't consider that information if I'm going to fulfill my duty. Um, under the contract. All right. So, you know, and it does present a difficult, uh, I guess, uh, position for the arbitrator only from the standpoint that, you know, you have one party who is wanting to emphatically let you know, this is a bad employee, <laughs> this is a bad employee, you know, and the other party is objecting and saying, you can't know that. Yeah, you, you got to unring the bell, though. So right. if they've wrong the yeah. exactly and and but I still feel that it is and I think I'm able to limit my evaluation to the information that they've agreed to to the rules that they've agreed to. If I can only consider you know the last um, two reprimands, and that's all I can consider. Um, because again, that is my role is to follow what they've agreed to. All right. Well, I, 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 with everybody's uh, indulgence, I want to move on to another topic here. And we've got a few more. And I mean, we could spend almost a whole hour on e each of these individually. Uh, uh, but let, 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 let's, uh, Jeannie, let me ask you to start the next topic on restricting evidence of disparate treatment in discipline cases. There are many articles, uh, some in the bibliography and otherwise, we've seen them in newspapers, uh, that refer to past disciplinary cases involving other employees as having created barriers to reforming uh, department policies down the road. You know, I'm, uh, I'm a police chief. I seem to be stuck with these uh, bad arbitrator decisions. Uh, maybe they were bad investigations or bad charges, but they were bad decisions. And, and am I going to be stuck with these forever? Uh, what advice as an arbitrator do you have uh, for departments and management to get out of this box, uh, new management comes in. They want to get out of the box. What are you going to tell them? So my advice would be that if if um, the new management puts in place whatever their policy is going to be, 
whether now we're having zero tolerance for you know, excessive force cases. And they put the uh, workforce on notice that that is what the rule, that's the rule and what the penalty is. I think that as the arbitrator, I'm constrained to focus then on that, um, that point in time. The, the whole past discipline is for the purpose of making sure that dis uh, looking at past discipline records is, is important to make sure that discipline is being needed, needed out fairly. Um, but if a line is being drawn to say that, you know, literally there's a new sheriff in town. And, um, and so now this is how it's going to work. Then I believe that the arbitrator has to, to follow that. I've had cases like that where, you know, um, there was a new uh, sheriff and uh, he had, I think it, his, it was on false statements or truthfulness. And there were a number of di past disciplines where the prior sheriff, um, you know, issued various levels of disciplinary action for dishonesty. Um, but what he was able to show, what the management ad advocate was able to show was that since he had been in place, every single offense of um, false state or dishonesty was handled the same way. Right, and we know that's an important issue in law enforcement because if people have to go testify in court and you don't want them to be collaterally impeached as being dishonest. Harry, you're representing people yes. all, all the time in arbitration. How often do you re end up relying on sort of a disparate treatment line of evidence? Let me think about that. Almost never. Really? And, okay. Yeah, here's, here's, this is really a fascinating question for me because in some ways it's a launching point um, to try to bring some of these things back uh, onto the most practical level because I'm just a practitioner. I'm not uh, creating policy. But uh, in terms of the the strict definition of desperate treatment, I almost never rely on it. And the reason is it has that uh, scent of, but he or she did it, that hopefully our parents uh, always admonished us against using. And my thinking is, you know, unless there's something absolutely convincing about that, because under this theory, we've already admitted the facts um, we should really be talking about, uh, you know, moving our career in the right direction and understanding the nature of it. Here's here are a couple of uh, footnote exceptions to my general rule. Uh, first of all, really, I look at it um, as something to open a window into cronyism, because the only times I'm ever talking about disparate treatment is when I find, which sometimes happens, is there one category of employee that's getting treated much, much differently and frankly better than my client. Second, uh, you know, the, I think one of the few times I've used it uh, was recently, and that was with a brand new, we'll say sheriff who uh, had, uh, and some of, some of us might be familiar with this character type, a, a wildly aggrandized, almost dictatorial, sense of uh, himself in this case, and was uh, just completely off the charts on minor discipline, almost taking it personally. So in that case, I showed the arbitrator, well, here's a few years of what somebody sane was doing on a discourtesy complaint. With the same sheriff? No, with a, di with a different, with different, a different one. Sheriff. Okay. This is what somebody sane was doing on his first case. Somebody sane, oh, I see, sane. 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 Okay. As right. opposed to what this uh, very interesting character type is doing. All right, so Paul Henderson, how do you deal with disparate treatment in your situation? Because the DPA didn't always exist. That, that, that is correct. And we were a, a different agency uh, before it was the Office of Citizens Complaint. And then we expanded the jurisdiction uh, by legislation uh, or voters went and expanded the jurisdiction, changed the name. But it's an issue that that comes up. And, and to me, I hate to 
keep bringing it back to all of the legal issues, but the issues uh, are generally about notice. And so, you know, if you're going to be disciplining for something, the issue is always the case of did people know and were they aware that they could be disciplined in this way? And that's the first level of analysis to me as a lawyer. Uh, but the secondary issue, which I think the, the panelists uh, also spoke to was in terms of the issue itself of having disparate treatment from changing and evolving rules for misconduct, to me are, have to be pretty flexible. Uh, because you do always have uh, a different or a new chief of police. You have frequently, uh, as is the case in San Francisco, revolving or different commissioners that actually hear some of the discipline cases as well. And they have to be allowed to have their own discretion that's fact sensitive and case by case analysis when they're hearing this case. So yeah. we, well, we hear it raised, but it's more, uh, it's raised as argument uh, to as mitigating factors. Let, let, me, let me ask Jeannie if she's yeah. run into this problem. It's a concern I've had as an arbitrator over the years. Jeannie, um, somebody wants to uh, point out disparate treatment, maybe the way Harry was talking about it, you know, that, that my guy or gal is getting treated worse than a bunch of other people in the past. They must have it out. So how, how do you handle that without having a mini trial on each of these five other cases, let's say, that are being referenced. What do you do? You know, it's really, it's not um, just as cut and dry as, oh, that person got a five-day suspension, suspension, so this the grieving in my case should get a five-day suspension. You definitely have to be able to, you know, to be able to distinguish the, the, the cases. Um, um, no, I don't, we're not going to have another trial on the other person's case. There may be other issues that were um, of relevance in the other case with regard to the person's tenure and their disciplinary history that is not before me. So that past discipline um, of other employees is um, somewhat of a guideline. It's not a hard and fast okay, so I'm going to make my decision in this case based on that. It's right. guidance. It's, right. a, it's it, you know, it's a, a reference point. Uh, you do, like uh, Paul said, everything you have to take on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. And, um, and so I think that it's helpful. And I think that bottom line, we operate with the rule of reasonableness. Um, and so to what extent does it, does it make sense to use those other disciplinary actions to determine what the dis discipline should be, um, what a discipline should be assessed in the case before me is, um, that's a part of, of the process to come just as a comparison. All right. Uh, let me turn to our third topic, um, harmless error. Uh, I know Florida's got a police officer, law enforcement officer, Bill of Rights. California does, and I think it's about 16 other jurisdictions or 15 around the country, and they tend to be pretty similar. Um, those of you who are watching in California, uh, Section 3303 and 3304, I guess, are you know, the, the guts of the, uh, the POBRA. And boy, they are detailed. I mean, there was a lot of time spent. Harry, were you one of the negotiators on that? Okay. No, that would be Mr. Yank and company. Steve. Oh, Mr. Yank, okay, on the last panel. All right. Um, I've had some of these cases, and uh, uh, you aren't the advocate, Harry, but if somebody said to me, you know, if it's in the police officer bill of rights, it's like scripture, and if there's a if there's a uh, uh, an error, like interrogation, they didn't record it the way they're supposed to record it or something under the statute, then you can't uphold the discipline. Right. Well. I mean, is that, was there prejudice that was caused by that? That's the question I want to ask, kind of a harmless error rule. And so how do you, what do you think about a harmless error rule? Well, what should be the consequences if there's a, a an investigation or interrogation uh, error? Is that sufficient standing alone to overturn a disciplinary action? Okay, this is a, another area that I want to, bring back down to at least my practicality practicality experience. Yeah. so yeah. first of all we we heard the introduction i've seen 
some of the other presentations and there's this idea that uh, cops have more rights than other people. We could talk about that in another- uh, I actually segment. said that. Yeah, yeah you did. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that maybe subtly during the course of this topic. But um, as a, a practical matter, first of all, from my perspective, these statutes are really just a reflection of due process which in turn uh, is it should be an encapsulation of the you know the concept of fairness. In practice, a couple of things I believe are absolutely true. First of all, I see myself in large part as part of an advocate. I'm the guardian of the process. So I take this stuff seriously. I do uh, cite chapter and verse, but I don't find uh, at least our particular statutory, Team that convoluted or that uh, difficult to follow or apply. When it comes to, and I, I think, you know, uh, Mr. Wintergrad, Arbitrator Wintergrad, what you said is exactly right. Uh, I, I've never had tremendous success in the arbitration um, realm uh, getting a case entirely dumped on a minor technicality. And so, what we're really, you know, as, as Steve Silver, whose 80th birthday today is the senior member of our firm and probably was involved in uh, drafting it. Yeah. Draft happy, it. happy birthday, Steve. Yeah, he's, you know, we should never win. I should never win a case. Okay. If, if uh, you know, if the department is doing what they're supposed to do, which is following the rules and adhering to concepts of evidence, I should lose, lose every single case. Having said that, it's really rare uh, that I'm going to win a case with an arbitrator on a technicality. You'll do better in court? I'll do much, much better in court on those very few uh, portions of the Peace Officer Bill of Rights that have exclusionary, complete exclusionary components of them. And uh, they're not many, you know, could I get uh, a bad interview or interrogation excluded? Yeah, but why shouldn't I? I mean, I guess, I guess the way I look at it is two things. First of all, when you're talking about harmless error, you know, sure my client's getting harmed, but also the process is getting harmed. And the question I'm gonna put back to you and back to the panel is, is it really asking too much of the government to be required to follow a simple set of rules? Well, uh, yeah. you know what, I could, I could jump in there, but I, I think I'm gonna let Paul go first and then Jeannie, because Jeannie actually has to apply it. So Paul. Yeah, so let uh, me just say. You it, pick it, up it, a case, you pick up a case, you, you, yeah. you're, you're investigating these cases, so. Right. Yeah, and, and so just to answer that question, is it too much to ask the government to follow the rules? It, that, that almost takes the issue out of context. Certainly the government and agencies, uh, especially particularly those that are focused and execute prosecution are following the rules and things just happen. And the main focus is, which is- Well, where, that's my line. Yeah, right, right. That's the main my focus defense, is right? the addressing the transgressions that may have taken place and having real accountability. and to the points that I think Harry raised efficiently before, uh, the issue is a standard of reasonableness in terms of whom you're presenting evidence to. Be that a court, be it an arbiter, be it the chief or a commissioner, or whomever you're presenting it to. And I think they try and try and adjust based on what's reasonable for whatever may have happened. If is a missed filing or, you know, there's some real strict rules in terms of filings and discipline and timeline. Well, have you ever had, have you ever had a case thrown out because of some technical uh, error regarding, uh, uh, you know, the interrogation process or the, uh, in, you know, the interview process where there are admissions and there are all kinds of limits on how admissions can be used? Have you ever had a case <laughs> thrown out? That's exactly the distinction that I was trying to make because now you're differentiating between what the subject matter will be or could be when you talk about applying a harmless error standard, right? Like you're differentiating and defining what it can be and should be. I haven't uh, had cases completely restricted for 
harmless or small things, but I have, and my agency in particular, had real challenges uh, in the past uh, before I was there, obviously, uh, in dealing with some of the timeline errors, like with 3304 limitations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had up to 16, sometimes as high as 24% of cases that would fall to the wayside that fell wow. outside of the statutory limitations. Now, of course, since I got there, we've had not one of those cases to lose jurisdiction for 3304 timeline uh, limitations, but it speaks to addressing which rules are fungible and which rules are not. And the, that, the timeline rule is one of the rules that is not fungible at all. And so when we're talking about, if we take a step back from this and take a look at one of the things that both you raised and Harry was talking about, the standards that we are redefining in terms of building parity for law enforcement agencies and other employees, when we start shifting what these guidelines are and the accountability looks like for the department or for law enforcement, All right. we really just have to make sure that we're balancing and not creating a whole new standard that is. All right. Well, let me, let, this is a good segue because I'm going to put Jeannie on the spot. Jeannie, yeah. are you ready? This is going to end this part of the discussion. Oh, okay. okay, so sure. in the world of arbitration, as we know, there's on one end a, a bunch of folks historically and even today who say, you know what, we are due process guardians. And then at the other end of the specter are some folks who say, well, you know, my primary focus is on the relationship. I'm talking about collective bargaining uh, relationship, the relationship between the uh, union or the employee organization and the employer and the well-being, the nurturing of that relationship, including reading the contract, et cetera. But, you know, on so, oftentimes those two uh, ends kind of come together, but sometimes they don't. So do you use a harmless error and prejudice rule uh, or do you fall on one end of that or the other? You know, what? Putting, with, with regard to harmless error, I think that is actually a very um, fascinating idea. And I think that it largely depends on the circumstances. Um, and, and you'll probably hear arbitrators say that a lot. It depends on the circumstances. It depends on the case. It depends on the fact. It depends on the arguments that are presented. Um, well, each case is different, right? Each, each case is different. Um, the with regard to harmless error, you know, are we talking about, um, you know, if, if it's a time timeliness issue, I may be it's just a, juris, a jurisdictional question, you know, even though, um, gosh, this, you know, the employer is not going to get to prosecute this case because they missed it, you know, by one day. Um, that's what the statute says, especially if we're talking about the um, legislation like the uh, right. law enforcement bill of rights you know right. i am constrained to follow the law um and where some parties and they incorporate the bill of rights into the collective bargaining agreement so then by necessity i have to i'm, I'm, right. I'm bound by it but if it's a if it's a question of well you didn't interview the right person or you should have interviewed this person who i told you to interview you know, uh, am I gonna overturn and say that the the interview well, is not fair? Yeah, you know? I mean, I guess if that missing witness was totally exculpatory and would have gotten the grievance off, well, then there's a case of prejudice, I suppose. And that, and exactly. Yeah. Harry, and that, that Harry. Harmful, and that is harmful error. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Harry, you can have the last word here. I, I think probably what you touched on is important, but I, I perceive that as a just cause not a statutory bill of rights issue in other words the missing the missing witness well sometimes the the argument is made by union counsel not necessarily yourself right that an element of just cause is the statutory obligation and okay. i'm going to you know, write that down i've never made okay. that no you didn't say quote winograd on on just cause okay. Or right. okay let's turn to just cause genie yes here's just cause public interest and reinstatement in relying on the traditional test in the labor field of just cause, actual cause, to support disciplinary action, is there a special role? Is there a special role for the public interest in deciding whether an employee should be reinstated? 
In other words, there's cause for discipline and then a separate analysis of cause for the penalty. And I mean, do, do you, should that be separately written into the law? Is it there already? Do, do we need anything further to be written in about it? And what does it mean? Yeah, I think that actually would be quite um, a, a dangerous area to kind of impose that element into the law or to uh, an agreement. Um, I was on another panel earlier today on police accountability, and we had discussion about the impact of the public opinion and whether or not it, it affects an arbitrator's uh, rulings. And um, and I, you know, and I explained that I've had a number of my cases end up in the in the media. Well, um, you know, I don't typically know that this case is was, you know, in the media spotlight before I get there. Most arbitrators don't. We don't right, know you what show the up, case is about. Yeah. Show right. up. And um, you know, so um you know, so that and so, but through the process of the hearing, the parties will often introduce, you know, media clips and things of that nature. The bottom line is that really does not influence my decision making. Um, I don't know. I, I, I tend to be a strict um, proponent of the evidence. I don't think it's my job. All right. To, well, let me nurture, ask you this. to nurture yeah. the relationship between the parties. I'm sensitive to the pressures that they're under, and I consider that in the whole context of what I'm evaluating. Uh, uh, it's not a factor let, that I would. Let, let me ask you this, and then the other panelists as well. This, this is an issue that was uh, uh, much debated within our little study group. And the question is, let's say there's a case. It's a run-of-the-mill case, except that there's an issue of race or gender or sexual orientation, some kind of prohibited discriminatory attitude or, uh, you know, it was involved with the law enforcement officer in the otherwise uh, routine administration of the law. And, uh, you know, so the argument is made. It was, it was part of the motivation, part of the intent of the officer. Is there a heightened public interest because of those factors in this time and place? I'll ask you, and then I would ask Paul and Harry. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I can speak to this um, in a recent, it's a recent, uh, it was a teacher case, and it was a racial, you know, implications in the media. And it was, it was a white teacher who put his hands on a black student, a male student. So as you can imagine, from the public's perspective, there was quite a bit of outrage. However, in through the hearing, there was no evidence, there was no implication that this particular teacher was motivated by race. As a matter of fact, he was an equal opportunity <laughs> um, Bad guy, you know, tough guy. <laughs> um, assaulting a teacher, you know. Um, so again, that is an example of, you know, where it, it was sensationalized because it had the element of race, but it had nothing to do with the ultimate motive. So did I consider that? Of course I considered it. Um, but it was, there was no evidence to support that. As, In that case, yeah. Okay. So Harry, Harry, what do you think? If if it's shown in a, a dismissal case, and it's not charged as a racially motivated type of misconduct, but it's an element. Maybe it has to do with a traffic stop or something, and pulling somebody out. And uh, uh, you know, there's a bunch of evidence that uh, uh, that's provided at the hearing that well, you know what, this officer has a whole record of stopping people of one color or one gender more than any anything else it, how does that play into the re reinstatement issue can you ever see uh, an arbitrator saying you know what because of the racial component there's a public interest we do not want that kind of person uh, on the force okay i it seems to me like that's a little a uh, bit different question than uh, what was on the paper, Professor, but uh, I'll do my best to. It is different. It yeah. is different. And, and so if you're asking me, 
should uh, racist cops be allowed on the force? Let me think about that for a minute again. No. It's, no, you shouldn't. Okay. Okay. So yeah. if, if there's proof that uh, someone's doing police work in a fashion that's, you know, disparately affects a certain group for that improper motivation, get them out. It's not good. Right, well, let me twist it a little bit. All right. Okay. So, you know, there's some police officers up in Seattle who participated. They were found to be inside the Capitol on January 6th. Right. I mean, all the evidence is there. Sort of the, the installed videos and data point cell cell monitor things. And they're there. Uh, they claim they didn't engage in anything other than, I guess, you know, they acknowledge trespass. But or maybe they were invited. And in. I don't know what their scoop is, but they're there and they're members. Maybe it's not Seattle. I think it was Ohio. And they're members of this group called the Oath Keepers, right? Which is set, uh, military and law enforcement, current and retired, dedicated to the Constitution. All right. With a number of the areas having some connection to sort of white identity politics. So, you know, what if it's shown that, you know, in that, that these officers are part of that? Is that, is that relevant? Is that part of the public interest? Well, that could be part of the public interest, but here's, you know, I want to be in these kind of situations very, very careful about, you know, what's really on the table in terms of an inquiry. So if the broader question, which, you know, I find kind of uh, in between the lines here is should we be applying uh, sort of um, loyalty tests, uh, you know, on our on our projected belief of what a, might, a certain group might be about, I think that's a, a difficult, you know, I think that's a slippery slope that if everybody thought, step back, thought about it carefully, no uh, right-minded person would be in favor of that. Well, we got um, a long history as we've discussed going back yeah. to the McCarthy era about these loyalty tests. Certainly. Anyway, so you want to look at it pretty carefully there. Okay. Yeah. Paul? Public okay. interest. Okay, yeah. We'll, we'll come back. We could okay. really go on with this, this topic I, area. I, I'm not going to go on and, and, and long, but I do want to reframe the issue that you just raised in terms of like the stuff that had happened at the Capitol, because it's beyond just an analysis of First Amendment rights and whether or not people are allowed to express themselves. You quantify the question with folks that were at the very least trespassing. But the context of the trespassing, well, first of all, let's just start with the trespassing because the trespassing in and of itself is a violation of the law. And I think that that is a consideration and part of what opens the door to analyzing whether or not you can take action. But to relate this to the subject that we are talking about, we have to discuss what well, I think what would be helpful beyond just uh, talking about the just cause standard is if there's a standard or is it possible to have a standard that balances the public interest in a way that that looks at the behavior and the discipline of the officer against the public interest as i would define it as the ability for this person based on the transgression and great based on the discipline to execute their job so could that officer with the discipline history could he still execute his job in a way that serves the public interest? That's not Harry, really yeah. the clear standard. But ha Harry, can you, ex how do you like, you like Paul's kind of re- How do I like it now? Reconfiguration, okay. So okay? I, I'm gonna, because this is such a highly charged topic, I'm gonna be really, really specific about my answers. Okay. And so here's answer number one. If a cop's committing a crime, then that needs to be analyzed you know, as a crime. Okay, generally speaking, with some exceptions, we don't want criminal cops uh, on the police force. Okay, well, I think everybody's in agreement about that. Yeah. Um, but again, these things, you know, we could flip them around as hypotheticals into different scenarios and, and uh, you know, the, the roots of our uh, conduct unbecoming case law here in California have to do with uh, gay teachers, for example. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, you know, it, it all seems very simple. And, you know, my guess is everybody agrees here. If you're, you know, storming the Capitol, you know, based on some insane theory, 
that's bad and it's going to you know lead people again right-minded people to uh question you know whether right. somebody right. be a cop but let's you know let's be super careful about that let's i be- agree all right let me let me let me pull back from the capital okay? okay i didn't want to i didn't want to like throw a, a, a too big a monkey wrench in here genie okay. so let's say a police officer is engaged in some conduct and is criminally charged uh the department learns about it and because of this charge which the department says has a nexus to the workplace they fire the officer subsequently the officer is not prosecuted or pleads no low and the case is you know finished settled out so to speak with a no time plea but they still have the underlying dismissal action going on if there is some public interest aspect to that criminal charge should that be coming in in the dismissal case if the if the criminal case went away or is that too easy yeah the criminal case went away <laughs> so but the, I mean, but the department still wants to fire him and, right. and, and because an of yeah. right so as an arbitrator i'm going to be evaluating it under their administrative rules right so it's an administrative case and um you know, and that's how, and, and that actually, that happens quite a bit, you know, where there's yep. a, some criminal component and, you know, and that's disposed of, and then it ends up in arbitration. And um, again, you know, and I even had where the, you know, the criminal case, the disposition of the criminal case uh, or the charges were included in the arbitration record. So, you know, you know, I'm, but we have two different standards. So exactly, the criminal right. standard is beyond, you know, a, a reasonable doubt. And uh, we, we're dealing with preponderance, um, depending on what the charge is. Some arbitrators do use a heightened standard. But I want to circle back a little bit All right. to the point. Finish it up and then we'll go to the last topic. Okay. okay. About the public interest, I truly believe that these questions really are most appropriately um, posed to the stakeholders with regard to police reform. I think that you know the unions, the police agencies, the um, community uh, relations uh, organizations, legislators. Um, need to be at the table and come up with a problem solving model to address the perception and the accountability issue and all of these things should be addressed well before it gets to arbitration and not put it in our lap. Exactly, exactly. The training as far as the labor relations that should be done jointly. And that that should help move things I think help us get to a better place. Okay. Last topic, Harry. This involves the impact of back pay determinations on related cases. You're representing a law enforcement officer who's been uh, put on an unpaid suspension uh, while the investigation uh, proceeded and then uh, dismissed. The officer, the union, seeks to postpone the hearing because some criminal charges are pending. Should that officer get back pay while that criminal charge is unfolded? Is what this if man, what is this recorded? Yeah, it is recorded. <laughs> <laughs> and there's going to be a transcript too, so it's page two twenty one, line eight. Okay, so uh, I, I listen. Arbitration, with all due respect to the fabulous Paul Henderson and his great system here where I'm sitting in the city and county of San Francisco. Um, arbitration is the best way to resolve disputes uh, from from my perspective. And here's why. You have someone who's not beholden to either side who comes in and calls balls and strikes and makes the tough choices, you know, re- regardless of the ramifications. And what about the back, that, back pay? How about back pay? Yeah, well, here's here's where I'm going with that. It's an alternative to a lawsuit for wrongful termination. So if someone's been fired improperly, the concept wrongfully, the concept is make him or her whole. 
And that's all, you know, it's about. And, you know, if an arbitrator, just to answer your question specifically, if an arbitrator decides that as the advocate, I've prolonged things uh, for too long by waiting out the criminal case, then the arbitrator is welcome. It's not required. And uh, strike this part from the transcript. Uh, you know, it's not required that they make the officer whole based on that choice. Maybe but, they told it. Okay. Yeah, but the other the other piece, um, briefly, of uh, the back pay awards is, in my view, it's a stupidity tax. Back to Steve Silver's comment: I should never win, and uh, you know they they need to you know monetarily because they're never gonna. You know, this is one thing I found absolutely to be true. The employer is never going to look at my win and go, you know, we were wrong about that. We really need to think again about how we treat people. Uh, they're going to make an excuse. And, you know, this is a tangible way uh, that they have to explain to everybody uh, that their mistakes are costly. All right. Paul Henderson. Yeah, I, I would just say just to tie it all together in terms of the comments that Jeannie was making and that uh, Harry was talking about, we have to remember when we're talking about any particular transgression, it is a case by case analysis, but let's just take, for example, a transgression has taken place, there are different tracks of accountability that each of those things could go in. So just because there is a criminal case that's pending or not, which may toll everything that generally leads is the, the tail wagging the dog in terms of what happens. But the resolution of that case, for whatever the reason, oftentimes is independent of how that same transaction right, right. could I get- I mean, sometimes, sometimes it is management in the city attorney's <laughs> office or the district attorney's office. You know what? Don't go to arbitration. Don't do the hearing. We don't want a use immunity issue potentially polluting the case. That's now, exactly it. it. And yeah. then you don't want your hands tied from different standards across the board because right. a case resolved in summary judgment. Right. Or so was in, settled. In, in that circumstance, then um, I could see management having to make up, you know, make whole for because it's management that wants a delay. But I was asking a different question, which is what if it's the officer? You know, should management be more ready? I don't know that's the right English, but should management be more ready to take these cases forward? Right. Because, Jeannie, you get a situation sometimes where you're looking at a big back pay exposure of a, a police officer case that may have been going on for two or three years. What do you do then? Well, those are the rules. Make hold. I mean, unless unless there was some other like there's some level of discipline that is going to be imposed, I might limit the back pay in that in that respect, because that employee set into motion a chain of events that caused all of this <laughs> to happen. Stuff to happen, okay. Right. All right. So all right. that that would be how it would resolve that. Right. Well, look, um, I can't believe it, but we're already out of time. You know, we're like right at the hour, practically. What is it, three fifty-nine uh, Pacific time? Um, any last comments? Any panelists? I do want to. Um, object to the comment that was made in the last panel by the last panelist before this session about arbitrators, um, you know, perhaps not making uh, a decision because they're concerned about being rehired. Um, I can, and of course, I can only speak for myself, but I can say that, you know, our role is to call balls and strikes. And if that is what you're doing, if it will, you know, you're in the wrong business because I think that, and this is coming from the position of being a former advocate. If if the parties uh, detect that, that is the sh a very short career for an arbitrator. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna decide every case. What's the saying? Decide every case as if it's your last case. As if it's your right? last one. I have to be able to sleep at night. Paul, Harry, you have any last comments before we sign off and return this to Catherine Fisk? I would just say thank you for having the conversation and bringing the panel together, especially part of what we've talked about today. I think it's clear, at least for me, that we are part of an entire movement beyond just a moment in addressing the types of reforms that we need to take at a local, state, and federal level. It's really timely given right. the change yeah, of administration. We, we've, we've seen all the, the different uh, strands that go yeah. on here. 
I mean, we had a discussion of several topics. I mean, we didn't come up with firm conclusions, but we talked about it. Yeah, I had conclusions in my mind. So okay. it like, yeah. <laughs> seems clear to me, like exactly what we need to do. So. <laughs> Harry Stern, last word. Yeah, just only I'm going to echo what uh, the great Paul Henderson said. <laughs> and uh, thank you. You know, I have a different perspective. I'm an advocate, but, you know, I'm also uh, a citizen and, you know, a person who cares about these things on a number of levels. The only thing I would add is we didn't get a proper uh, introduction of the great Barry Winograd. Oh, come on. Cut it out. Yeah. Uh, what happened right. to that? I was, you know. No, I, I got my bios okay. in the materials. You don't need to. Okay. Do that. All right. That's okay. Thank you. Arbitrator, mediator, uh, law lecturer at Berkeley Law, whatever, you know. Past president of the National Academy of Law. Thank you, Jeannie. Right. Thank you. All right. All right, everybody. It's been great. Uh, thank you very much for your participation here at the end of this webinar. Catherine, are you with us? I am indeed. There I you go. To echo the thanks that Barry said to all of our speakers today, and especially to thank Barry Winograd, Felton Henderson, John True, Joe Groden, and Ron Yank, who were the brains behind and this. And you, episode. and you, you. Thank you, Barry. Um, <laughs> and we're hoping very much that the discussions today will contribute to important law and policy reforms of policing going forward. Um, I want to point out that people who attended could get CLE credit. And so you should email Pamela Erickson, Pamela Erickson at berkeley.edu to get CLE credit. The video of the entire day will be available on the Berkeley Center for Law and Work website. Um, where there will be a YouTube link in memoriam, or in perpetuity rather, I guess. As long as YouTube is memoriam around. is good. <laughs> and then finally, crucially, but behind the scenes, I want to thank Jenny Boyden, who has been managing the spotlight. So she's had to pay attention every minute for five hours. Thank wow. you, Jenny. I want to thank Pamela Erickson also, who also has been here all day and is going to be managing CLE credit and other things. This simply could not have happened without them. And then last but not least, I want to thank Ann Jackson, who's the director of events for UC Berkeley School of Law. Uh, without Thembi and her team, absolutely nothing would happen at the law school. Thank you, everyone. Um, be well. Thank you.